Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. And as we promised earlier in the week, today is our special uh, reflecting on Jim's time in Ukraine. As you know, he was there late last summer and he was there again for uh, more than a week in March. He's back now and uh, ready for the full download, as he likes mm. to say. So, uh, uh, Jim, as we, just before we get into the, I guess we're going to go bad Good, crazy kind of a thing. Morally here this- ambiguous second martini. They draw, draw your own conclusions about this guy I want to talk about. Yeah. Exactly. You talked about this a little bit on Monday, but real quickly, why did you decide to make a second trip? So when I went to the first time, when people ask me, how do you summarize the trip? I'm like, oh, you know, the Ukrainians I spoke to were the most amazing, wonderful people who are going through hell. On that first trip, I talked to people who had survived the Russian occupation in Bucha, who had helped move the bodies out of cars that had been shot up. Like just, you know, I have pictures on my phone that that nobody should be seeing. It's like, okay, I got to come back. This this story is not done. As you mentioned, it was late August. Six months have gone by. I think it's safe to say that the counteroffensive that was launched in the summer of last year has not succeeded as the uh, Ukrainians hoped. Uh, it's inflicted casualties on the Russians and ironically, without a navy, Ukraine has done better in the fights in the Black Sea and sank a lot of Russian boats. But I I knew that the state of the country was going to be different, that it was probably going to be darker uh, and more pessimistic. I asked people, you know, how's how's the winter been? And the interesting thing is a lot of people said, actually, the previous winter was worse. Uh, That was when Russia was really targeting the power grid, power stations, uh, doing everything possible to knock out the heat during the winter to make life as miserable for the Ukrainian civilians uh, as, as possible. The assessment I got from a lot of Ukrainians over there was that, yes, this, the, things have gotten worse. It's been tough to hold the line. The lack of support from the U.S. over the last six months or so has, you know, complicated things. Uh, you think I, I was reminded and thought about, we can argue about whether the Afghan government was ever going to hold out against the Taliban in the long run, whether it had too many internal divisions and flaws, corruptions, things like that. Um, But also that the U.S. told the Afghan army, "Okay, go defend us from the Taliban. Oh, by the way, we trained you to fight with air support and we're cutting off your air support. We're not going to do that anymore. And unsurprisingly, the Afghan army did not fight as well when it did not have the air support. It's a somewhat similar situation with the Ukrainians, that they had gotten used to having this steady supply of arms and in particular artillery shells and all kinds of weapons from both the U.S. and its NATO allies. And that got cut off and that the U.S. You know, Congress has refused mostly because of House Republicans and has not cho- chosen to not resupply them. Other NATO members have tried to make up the slack. The Danish have sent all of their artillery shells, which is good of them. I think it also is a demonstration. Like, no one talks about the grand arsenal of Danish artillery shells, uh, obviously. You know, the Baltic states have sent a lot. Uh, the Nordic states have sent a lot. The Czech Republic, by the way, for the entire time, about you know, how, much, how much should NATO send from its existing stockpiles? The Czechs were like, well, we've been arms dealers for a long time. We know a lot of people around the world. And we know a lot of people around the world who don't want to deal with America because they see America as, as preachy and, and you know, lecturing them and hectoring them about their morality. The Czechs... We're not going to bother with any of that. We just ask, hey, you got any you got any spare artillery shells? And lo and behold, lots of countries around the world do have 155 millimeter artillery shells that they can spare and that they're willing to sell and that the Czechs were happy to transfer it. And lots of NATO members are now paying into this. And this is a way to put more shells into the hands of Ukraine. And oh, by the way, the Czechs are not saying which countries are supplying them so that they are not uh, subject to Russian retaliation for helping the Ukrainians. But overall, I I think the the first and really kind of eye-opening interview I had over there was with uh, David Knowles, who runs a easily the second best podcast out there next to this (laughs) one. Actually, the editors and Jim and Mickey show. Um, But (laughs) Ukraine, the latest, which is run by the Daily Telegraph, and it's a great way to stay on top of what's happening out there. And also Kyle Orton. Greg, I hate to disappoint you. It's not the former Bears quarterback, Kyle Orton. I was wondering. He's a national national security strategist, two really smart guys who know the history of the region and are just on top of all kinds of stuff. And um, Kyle summarized it very succinctly. It's been a very Russian way of fighting the war, which is to say they have made every mistake conceivable. They have just sent, I think it might've been David who used the term human meat waves at the enemy, uh, which to give you a sense of the, you know, like the estimates of 300,000 Russian casualties, not all killed, killed and injured or missing in action, things like that. That's, that's all, you know, pretty likely. 
but they just kept hammering them and they just keep coming. And the, this is a war of attrition and that Russia is starting to, you know, enjoy the benefits of that. It just began the war with a much larger army and they are wearing down the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians, in addition to needing arms, need more manpower. Right before uh, we or shortly before we tape this podcast, the Ukrainians did lower the uh, uh, recruitment age from 27 to 25. Now, to American ears, that sounds unbelievably high. We're used to people getting drafted at age 18. The Ukrainian philosophy, and I don't know whether this is the right philosophy, but I, admit, I think there's a certain logic to it, is that we want the older brothers to fight the war and we want the younger brothers to handle the rebuilding of the country after the war. Also, I suspect that the idea is that by 27, you hopefully have gotten married, you've hopefully had kids to ensure that there's another generation of Ukrainians to exist as a country uh, a generation from now. So there was a logic to the way in which, you know, oh, by the way, the draft age up goes up until 60 in Ukraine. Um, so I'm not making this up when one of the relief groups told me one of the biggest demands is for Advil. There are a lot of guys out there with back pain who are literally out fighting on the front lines. So in case you're wondering if you've heard about any Ukrainian charities or support groups, yes, they all need help. They still need money. They still need donations. Uh, and they'll eagerly take anything anybody wants to donate. That's a short version of how are things going? <laughs> you know, but <laughs> with all of that in mind, the actual territory that the Russians have managed to take back is pretty small. Now, if they get no support from the U.S. You know, from now until, let's say, the end of the year, David Knowles said he talked to Ukrainian generals who said, we'll probably have to pull back to the Dnipro River, which kind of bisects the country down the middle. Um, so you could conceivably see significant Russian territorial gains later in the year. Right now, the Ukrainians are hanging on to the current lines, you know, probably by their metaphorical fingernails. And so I think you just said it, but reiterate what the timeline is for what they can hold currently and uh, what they can accomplish if they do get the aid that they're hoping for from us. Yeah, um, it was mostly new people I was interviewing this time. But one guy who I interviewed a second time was Marian Zablotsky. He's a member of the Ukrainian parliament. He's a former member of the Ukrainian SBU, which is a combination FBI, CIA type institution in the government. Um, very well informed, very plugged in everywhere. And, I, you know, my standard opening questions to Ukrainians would be, how are you doing? Because almost everybody's got some amazing story uh, about how they've gotten through the first two years of the war. And how, are, how do you think things are going? And so I said to Marianne Zablotsky, you know, so how do you think the morale on the front is? And he gave me a very succinct answer. It's like, well, the morale gets better when you're able to shoot back. And yes, that is often the case. Uh, and in current supplies of shells, it sounds like the, in a lot of places on the line, the Ukrainians can fire back about two, one or two artillery shells for every 10 that the Russians are firing back. Very tough to win a war when the other guys can now shoot you 10 to 1 or you know 5 to 1. Now, that having been said, kind of foreshadowing something else I want to talk about, basically, one of the generals had described it as uh, it's like fighting a mirror, that, that if, you, if you try to... Uh, the, the Ukrainians will come up with some sort of innovation with drone technology or something like that, and it will work for a while. But within three months, it becomes outdated. The Russians have, will figure out some way to adapt to that. Now, it may adapt by just sending more guys. Uh, the, the wins that Russia is getting are coming at enormous cost to them. Um, the other thing I think was kind of a factor in just the different mood between now and when I was there last August. Uh, when I was there in August, it was probably like a month to six weeks after the Pogosin coup attempt in Moscow, uh, the, the Wagner group and, you know, trying to march its way to, uh, to, to Moscow. And there was a sense of like, oh, oh, Russia maybe is a lot less stable than it looks. Maybe there's a lot more internal dissent in Russia that might actually make somebody in the Russian government say, we're, we're tired of this. We've lost too many people. That's it. The war's over. No one has any illusions about that right now. I, I think it's very clear that Putin doesn't care that he will sacrifice as many troops as it has to in order to fulfill his vision of a restored Russian empire. And Ukraine is not does not have unlimited guys. Um, as I mentioned, they lowered the uh, draft age. And it's worth noting you heard more murmuring about the 800,000 Ukrainian men of service age, which, again, is like 27 to 60 or 25 to 60, uh, who are living abroad right now. And there's an increasing murmuring about that. And the other last thought I will do on just kind of the state of the war and how could this end? Look, again, nobody's serious about uh, negotiations yet. Nobody's lost enough. Nobody's, you know, serious about that. But you do hear certain Ukrainians with this sentiment of looking at the, the Donbass and these eastern uh, oblasts, or what they're called, but basically states, uh, and saying, there's not much left out there, that, that the cities have been leveled, that there's not that many Ukrainian speaking Ukrainians. There are some who are being oppressed right now, 
But anybody who could get out did get out. And a question of how many lives do we want to sacrifice in order to get those absolutely bombarded no man's land in World War I style territories, uh, how, how, much, how many men are we willing to sacrifice to get that back? And that's kind of scoffing and it's not all that serious. But I do think that day, like the first trip, everybody's like, we're getting every square centimeter back. We are not going to get, you know, we're going to get these bastards. And I think there's just a recognition of that's really difficult, particularly if U.S. support is not coming in a steady, you know, supply chain the way it had. Um, so I don't know how this war ends. I, I do know that there's still a lot of fight left in the Ukrainians. I, they, they see themselves as not having any choice. You, you hear what happens to people who are in the occupied territories. You look at the people, what happened in Bucha when the uh, the Russians were there. You know, if you if you surrender, your grandmother, your wife, your mother, and your daughter get raped, and you get shot in the head. They're not interested in negotiating with an enemy like that. So that's the current thing. They're, they're, this fight will not be ending anytime soon. I don't intend to go back anytime soon, but I do intend to go back someday. And uh, my guess is the war will still be going on a year from now, pretty conceivably two years from now, and perhaps even well beyond that. Jim, there's one other thing you wrote about while you were over there that I just wanted to get further insight on. Uh, it was the idea that, and, and Zelensky certainly has been criticized for this, and that's for suspending elections mm -hmm. uh, while the, the war continues. And the argument that you heard from folks while you were over there was, we can't safely conduct mm. elections in the entirety of, of Ukraine. And until we can do that, uh, it's not really a representative vote of what the Ukrainian people want. And my mind, when hearing that, immediately went to 1864. We still had a mm -hmm. presidential election. I'm sure we still had, obviously, all the congressional elections. The southern states did not participate. The Confederacy uh, was not part of the election that year. But the election still went on, uh, in, in part just to show that the functioning of government where you can mm -hmm. still happens, and also because... Um, depending on who your leader is, to, once you stop doing that, it's easier to keep not doing that. So what sense did you get from talking to them about that? Yeah, I, Greg, there are times I very much have that mentality. And on the first trip, we spoke to the deputy mayor of Irpin, one of the suburbs of uh, Kiev, where they'd managed to fight off the Russians fairly well, and uh, said, could you guys have local elections? Uh, could you, you know, like, because the idea of like big national elections, roughly, I think 18% of Ukrainian territory is currently occupied by the Russians. So obviously they can't participate in this. Suspension of elections is because the country is under martial law. The parliament voted to and upheld the uh, martial law. In other words, the suspension of elections is all happening as it should under the Ukrainian constitution. This is not some crazy thing that Zelensky pulled out of his butt. Uh, this is, you know, all within the constitutional parameters it ought to be. Um, the second thing, and I spoke to mostly opposition uh, members of parliament, if the election were held today, Zelensky would win re-election. Uh, it wouldn't even be that close. And it's not a matter that everybody is as high on Zelensky as they were, say, in the first year of the war. It's just that there's nobody else who has remotely that kind of standing uh, in, the, in the eyes of the Ukrainian people. Uh, I would also point out, by the way, and I spoke to um, just your classic old school newspaper editor out there in Kiev, who has made the observation that he's not sure Zelensky will run for re-election when they have elections again. Uh, that they've, you know, Not only this past history of Winston Churchill losing re-election in 1945, shortly after the war ended, um, his assessment was that Zelensky's exhausted. That, that, that he's been, the, you know, living with the prospect that the Russians want to kill him for the better part of two years and change now. And once the war ends, particularly if it ends on terms favorable to Ukraine, Zelensky may be like, God bless you, good luck. I'm gonna go make a lot of money in the West as a guest speaker. I've done my time. So the idea that this is some power move by Zelensky does not seem particularly likely. And then the third thing um, put to me by uh, a woman who works as a translator out there, just made the observation, like the Russians bomb funerals. The Russians bomb any large public gathering. So could you imagine what it would be like to have a national election and having lots of Ukrainians gathering in one place to vote? It would make a very tempting target. You'd probably see a lot of dead Ukrainians. And then do you do you count the votes from the polling place that got bombed? Do you postpone them? You know, just logistically at this point with the threat of Russian bombs, it's just not you know, like, yes, we you know, that U.S. held elections in 1864. The Ukraine Confederacy did not have an air force that could bomb polling places in in the north. If they if they did, things would have gone out, gone pretty differently. So, just as a matter of logistical and security and preserving human life, it strikes me the Ukrainians have good reasons to not hold an election. You're hearing a little bit more. There's a yearning for a desire to get back to 
quote unquote normal politics and the ability to disagree with wartime leaders. I, I think there is a little more, you know, it's, it's starting to chafe. It's starting to be some frustration. But I think most Ukrainians understand that holding elections right now is just not a realistic option. Major oversight by the Confederacy not to launch the Air Force, because as you know, the British se- the British seized our airports during the revolution. Yeah. <laughs> according, yeah, to Trump, according to that one Trump speech that one time. But, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll have a lot more to say here in just a second. But first, for Patriots, head over to fourpatriots.com slash martini, where you can get lots of good deals, including on the Patriot Pure Line items, including the UV phone sanitizer, the UV wand, the sanitation solution machine, and the disinfecting power bank. But the big news over there at fourpatriots.com slash martini is that the deluxe three-month survival food kits are back in stock after being sold out for more than a year. And one of the reasons that it took a while to get them back is because they're better than ever with new exclusive recipes on things like pancakes, mac and cheese, chili, potato soup, spaghetti, lasagna, and a whole lot more. There's 688 total servings per kit, or about just under eight per day. 100% satisfaction guaranteed. You too can stash away food and be confident that when a disaster strikes, you and your family will be ready. Go to fourpatriots.com slash martini to get the deluxe three-month survival food kit and the peace of mind you deserve. Plus, get free shipping on orders over $97. That's the number four, patriots.com slash martini. That's four patriots. Dot com slash martini. All right. The good martini is still to come. This is what Jim called the morally neutral <laughs> martini. And so, uh, Jim, you've written in the uh, Washington Post about this guy. I hope I'm saying his name right. Ilya Ponomarov. Interesting character who, on the one hand, uh, may be responsible or, or at least uh, involved in the plotting of some questionable activities against the Russians. But uh, at the same time, he's also showing quite a bit of moral courage when he didn't necessarily have to against the Russians. So you sat down with this guy. Tell us what you discussed and just kind of the vibe you got from him. I felt very, very lucky to go out there the second time. And how do you how do you get these interviews? Well, I'm traveling with a friend who's been to Ukraine a bunch of times. Um, but you, you talk to one person, you say, oh, is there anybody else to be good to talk to? And they put you in touch with other people. They put you in touch with other people. And this is how I came to be sitting at a restaurant table with Ilya Ponomarov, uh, former member of the Russian legislature, the Duma. Uh, back in 2014, he was the only one who voted against the annexation of Crimea. Um, so early, you know, going back years, didn't like the direction of the Russian government and Russian society under Putin, was willing to publicly take a stand. And he paid the price in that about a year later, he was accused of embezzlement. He denied the charges. He said it was political retribution by Putin. It's not like the Putin government wouldn't do such a thing like this. Uh, Led the country, has to live in exile, uh, ended up in Ukraine and is now the political head of the Freedom of Russia Legion, which is a group of Russian citizens or former Russian citizens who have taken up arms against the Russians in Ukraine. I think it is impossible to dispute that... uh, you know, Ponomarov could have easily lived in the Duma. He could have voted yes for the annexation. He could have gone along with the Putin line and lived a very comfortable life. And he chose not to do that. And I think that's a very brave and very noble, very righteous thing to do. Where it gets a little more complicated um, is that back in uh, 2022, there was a car bomb that blew up in Moscow and killed Darina Dugina, who was the daughter of an ultra-nationalist writer and somebody who's considered a Putin's favorite philosopher, Alexander Dugin. And Dugin, Alexander Dugin was calling for the invasion and occupation of, of Ukraine years and years ago, and he's considered very influential. It is largely believed that the car bomb was aiming for him. They switched cars and uh, ended up killing his daughter, who apparently also has her own litany of allegations, including abuse of prisoners of war and things like that. Uh, welcome to a part of the world where nobody has particularly clean hands. Now, I should point out, that uh, Ponomarov told me that he had he didn't had no role in that car bombing. All he did was communicate the message from the people who did the p- car bombing. Also, O.J. Simpson believes he did not kill his wife and a waiter. Um, you know that that uh, I'll leave it to you to decide how. It, let's just say if he wasn't the guy who did it, he knows the guy who did it. And basically, when you hear about uh, a, a Ukrainian strike on Russian targets on Russian soil, particularly, you know, uh, oil refineries and, and things like that, the drones that have flown over Moscow, one flew over the Kremlin, that is the Russian resistance. And he's very plugged in with that. And the interview, and I, I, if you haven't read my uh, column about this in The Washington Post, I urge you to do so. I was kind of amazed how open he was about this. Uh, and I guess it's none of it's classified information, but this is like, so he was very open about how do we get people 
who are angry about what Putin is doing, angry about the war and want to do something to stop it. Um, how do they end up in the Russian Legion and the sheer number of folks who can't end up in the Russian Legion in Ukraine, who can't get out of the country safely? How, what do they do? And they end up becoming part of the Russian resistance and part become part of these efforts. And he did say that he had a role in that drone strike above the Kremlin. It had fireworks and it. it was not a very high, there was no serious damage or injuries to it. That having been said, the, the fact that they could get a drone over the Kremlin, uh, obviously this was you know, huge worldwide news and kind of a real shot in the arm to the morale of the Ukrainians. And, and, and Ponomara very much believes that the Ukrainians have to strike targets in Moscow, that the only way the Putin will feel any pressure to stop the war will be as if you know the elites in Russia suffer. Now, while I'm out there is when they had that terrible theater uh, attack uh, in, in Moscow. There was uh, ISIS came out and said they did it. The Ukrainians said we had nothing to do with this. Uh, our, my interview with Ponomaro was, was like two or three days beforehand. So when I see, he's telling me about the importance of hitting the elites in Moscow. And then I hear, Dixon, oh, there's this terrible mass shooting at his theater. Oh, I hope that wasn't the guy. By the way, let me also point out, Ponomaro, like the Russian guard would love to kill this guy. They would love to blow this guy up. They, he travels with security. I was sitting like three feet away from them. And uh, just periodically thinking, you remember that old song by the police, Don't Stand Too Close to Me? You know, if, if the sniper isn't having a good day, I don't want to be that close to this guy. But fascinating. And, you just, and, and I think this is a guy who is willing to accept a certain amount of risk to stand up for what he believes in. Uh, as I mentioned, he's he got to travel with security. He also believes that attacking the elites in Russia that most of us would classify as civilians is not just justified, but that it is necessary to stop that. And I think, I think everyone, I think a lot of us would agree that puts you in a morally gray area. Uh, it's a little more complicated. I don't know if shoppers or theater goers or folks like that in Russia are necessarily a legitimate target. We have we in the West have very uh, stricter laws about that. And as I said, this is a part of the world that where you know darkness and and war crimes and stuff like that. It only happens in days ending with a Y. Uh, it's kind of normal out there. I'm not saying it should be normal. I'm not saying I'm telling you how the world is. And a lot of people, you know, a couple of people characterize my interview with him as an endorsement. I do not endorse everything that he says and does and stands for. I do find it fascinating. And I said just the the, the stories and talking about how the Russian uh, secret police and, and FSB are looking for these guys and how you get them out of the country and how you try to find get visas and, and all. Really, just you know. It was. I write spy novels. This was spy novel stuff, and uh, so just a, a fascinating conversation. And again, the sort of conversation I would not be able to have unless I went over there to Ukraine and could be the guy in person. Did you refrain from food and drink while you were uh, meeting with this guy, just in case the polonium ended up at the wrong table? Uh yes. Okay. Yes, I did. <laughs> and no, and no, one, no one. No one said, "Jim, you're not drinking it." Yeah, we, we had dinner after. He and his. He and his, He and the bodyguard that I could spot could uh, left. Uh, it's conceivable he may have had more than one uh, watching him and stuff. So, yeah, yeah, my life was was taking turns into things that are much more uh, much more dangerous clicky than, than I'm used to. So this sounds like a guy that Jack Bauer would find himself forced to team up with as briefly as possible to advance the plot. Would that be a fair assessment? That's yeah. I, I, look, maybe it is when you're dealing with uh, Vladimir Putin, who, who rules with such an iron fist, who has so many resources, who has just so, you know, spies everywhere. Maybe your tactics have to change. Maybe maybe there is no nice, clean, or easy way to fight against Putin if you're a Russian uh, who, who opposes what Putin's trying to do. All right, Jim, on to our final martini now, but our, our good martini, perhaps the coolest part. You talk about this as Tony Stark's high-tech workshop. It's basically a secret drone facility secret in its location not in the fact that it exists obviously since they're letting you write about it the drone facility that that as you mentioned earlier in our conversation here has also been very helpful in uh, taking the fight to the russians and uh keeping ukraine mm. uh, afloat as long as it can military wise so uh, how did you hear about it and what did you learn there okay well I, I was hoping you'd set it up like that because there's a considerable amount of backstory uh, the first is that uh, my family and friends were not enthused about me going back to Ukraine. Um, I have tried to emphasize to them that on my first trip, I didn't hear or see anything related to or no anti-aircraft guns. Air raid sirens went off a lot, I think probably like 13 or 14 times over the course of the, the week and change. Um, but as I've said, the Ukrainians treat it like a car alarm going off down the street. They just largely ignore it. Uh, I went to the, the, you know, the first trip, I went down to the air raid uh, shelter a couple times. And after a while, I'm like, OK, 
this nothing ever happens. You know, I, I'm not. I'm going to go like a local. I'm going to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be relaxed about it. Uh, and as I discussed earlier in the week, that worked out fairly well on this trip until 4 a.m. on Thursday when I woke to the sound of a big boom, a flash of light in the sky, and uh, later learned that the Russians had launched 31 missiles at the city of Kiev when I was in it, uh, 29 cruise missiles, two ballistic missiles, and what I heard was the sound of a Patriot missile intercepting it. So the guys I'm traveling with, uh, and you know, they, they know people who know people, um, and apparently I'm told uh, somebody in Zelensky's office was aware of my reporting there. They're, so unsurprisingly, they're a fan because I keep saying we should be helping these people out. And there was talk about, you know, do, do you want to go to the front? I had told everyone in my family, I'm not doing anything crazy risky. I'm not, you know, the, when we go out there, it's very minimal risk. Going to the front is not minimal risk. There was talk about going in an armored car. There was talk about you have to wear personal protective equipment. And I know my friends who I was traveling with really wanted to go, but I'm like, guys, I... If I go back, if I go to the front and I come back, I say, hey, remember I told you I wasn't going to take any crazy risks over in Ukraine? Hey, let me tell you about going to the front. You know, and I just decided this is not, not the right. So they had a lovely, and I, I'm not exactly, consolation prize, which is like, would you like to see our secret drone factory? And, you know, hell yes. That's, a, you know, um, <laughs> and I, I, I tried to write very carefully because they, and they were fairly good about saying, yeah, you can take pictures of this, but you can't publish this. You can talk about this. Yeah. There's stuff I know that, um, can't tell you if it's pretty awesome. Um, but what I can say is that this was a facility, um, I'll just say, uh, they can give you the location, somewhere in central Ukraine, just leave it at that, um, that the Russians have already tried to blow up. It's not sure whether the Russians know what's being done here and what's so significant. But let's just say they, they fired a very big missile at it. And once again, air defense has managed to uh, succeed that. Um, the guy I was speaking to, who I, I just kind of characterize as like the Tony Stark guy. He's, he's fast talking. He spoke, spoke very good English. Uh, fast moving. Was eager to share what he could share, but also like kind of, um, this guy's got a million things to do and all of them need to be done now. And lives are at stake based on what comes out of this facility. So this facility initially started with um, basically giant batteries. You know, troops in the field need to be able to recharge everything from their cell phones to their electronic, you know, basically like how do you recharge stuff that needs to be recharged. And they were using civilian stuff off the shelf. He used a off-color term to describe what they were. And as he points it out, like the stuff that was available in the civilian market, oh, you're going for a picnic and you need to you know, bring something to charge your cell phone or something like that. And you'll use it once every three weeks or something like that. Unsurprisingly, Ukrainian troops in the field were using them intensely all the time and they were a not lasting very long, breaking and, and you know not charging very quick, and b apparently bursting into flame, uh, which is very bad when you're trying to stay hidden and you don't want the Russians to detect you with thermal gear or, or, or anything like that, or just generally you don't want batteries to burst into flame in general. So they basically had to figure out how do we build something that is very durable, very reliable, portable enough to be carried around in a backpack. Uh, but that we can outfit there and that this will, will charge their stuff and be easily recharged all the time. And within a matter the other what the um, Ukrainian government has done pretty much shortly after the war was this, I think they call it like uh, defense one. Basically, the entire Ukrainian defense industry was told, you're all on the same team. You might all be separate companies. You might all be separate labs. You might all be separate R&D groups, but you all work together now. If one of you has a discovery, you're sharing it with everybody else. You're sharing all your data. Everybody's, you know, and I imagine if you're an engineer. And you just care about solving problems. You just care about innovation and figuring out what's the best solution we can find. This is spectacular. And this is a real, this is the sort of thing that only happens in wartime. Because generally, you know, in the U.S., like uh, Northrop Grumman and Boeing, you know, they, they don't hate each other necessarily, but they don't necessarily want to share all their secrets. They don't want to share all their discoveries. And in the Ukrainian defense industry, everybody works with everybody else right now. Oh, oh, by the way, like they all effectively are not quite working for free. Um, but as he put it, everybody who's working there has some other source of income. So a lot of these guys are working part time. They're getting paid what basically is the equivalent of U.S. four thousand dollars a year. Uh, and as he pointed out, that's like covering gas and lunches. That's that's, you know, even by the way, well, by the way, the, the, the exchange rate between the U.S. dollar and Ukraine is really nice. So it's you know, $4,000 a year to, to a typical Ukrainian might not be as bad as it sounds here in the United States. That said, it's not really a living wage. And if you're a really skilled engineer, your wages are usually considerably higher. So everybody who's there is A, 
doing this because they want to help the war effort and they feel a need to do this. They feel a calling. They feel that this is their patriotic duty. And two, as I said, there's all the, by the time people hear this conversation, it's conceivable this factory will have been bombed. I hope it isn't. It doesn't. Yeah, but clearly the Russians have some idea that something interesting is going on there. And that's just a fact of life. As I pointed out, like there are a lot of places you could be in Ukraine and there's a chance of something big, heavy and Russian falling on your head or exploding. So there's that. But the other thing which they saw, which I was allowed to take a picture of and I was able to put out there, were their ground drones. Um, they have talked they talk a lot about aerial drones. And there's been a decent amount of coverage of that. Um, a lot of these, by the way, are purchased in China and they take the basic frame. They'll upgrade the battery. They'll up, this is the aerial drones I'm talking about right now. Uh, upgrade the battery, upgrade the camera, upgrade anything else. And they basically take the civilian ones and figure out ways to make it drop a grenade. And so like you're, you know, they, they doesn't require predator drones or these really fancy stuff. The Ukrainians will just take stuff off the shelf and figure out how to turn it into something lethal. The other thing he talked about, which was, again, utterly fascinating, was the measure and countermeasure for drone signal jamming. Uh, last trip when I was in Odessa, uh, I went to a uh, volunteer center that made camouflage netting for uh, for the troops. And a couple of Ukrainian soldiers were there. I suspect their visit was timed to uh, you know align with when my friends and I were there. And they have these things that look like something absolutely out of science fiction. If you have comic book fans, if you've ever seen a Rob Liefeld gun, because Rob Liefeld had this very distinctive way of making his guns look massive. Uh, it looks like something out of this and it doesn't shoot projectiles, but it shoots a signal that disrupts the signal from the Russian drone controller to the Russian drone. So troops in the field have this, and it's a way, it's the drone's coming along, it's going to either survey, either surveillance or, or attack you, it will drop like a stone. And then you grab it, and you see if you can you know, collect any useful uh, data from it. Well, apparently, this is the new spy versus spy, measure versus countermeasure uh, development in the war. And they, like the future of, of warfare is being created right now on the battlefields of Ukraine. Because what they were telling me is that stuff that worked three months ago and would stop a Russian drone in its tracks doesn't stop it now. In other words, the Russians, you know, like the Ukrainians are really good at figuring out ways to disrupt these signals. And the Ukra Russians are very good at figuring out ways. One thing he could disclose was, I guess, the first generation of signal disruptors. He described it as picturing the signal going out like a butterfly. Like it goes out in waves and extends out on a curve. But if the drone was directly above you, it would not disrupt the signal and the drone could drop some bomb on you and kill you. And he said that there are they've watched videos of guys out in the field waving their disruptor weapons and wands and stuff. And the last thing these guys ever see is a Russian drone coming at them because it doesn't work. Um, oh, by the way, speaking of Russian drones, I get again, I have a million and one stories and I want to thank you, Greg, for giving me the time to just download all of these. Uh, we're in Lviv, one of the first nights in there speaking to a young woman. young, like she's probably in her mid to late 20s. Um, but she never learned how to drive and she decides you know, the war is on. I need to help, you know, volunteers and stuff. I need to learn how to drive. Russian drone flies over during her driver's test. Um, and so thankfully she was not marked down for failing to use a turn signal to let the Russian drone know where she was going. The test was actually canceled at that point, And I think that's a good idea. Having now teenage drivers in my house, the teenage, the driving test is challenging enough. I think Russian airstrikes and drones would be another thing that would kind of freak you out while you're driving. I don't know if they cover that in the manual either. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, so like I, I'm getting, you know, toured around this facility and I just, it's, an old, it's an old factory from, from, let's just say, the Soviet days. It's not going to narrow it down very much for the, for the Russians. Uh, and now it just, you can just smell the soldering in the air. And they are working on all kinds of stuff, mostly as a ground drones. They can lay landmines. I know we're not big fans of that here in the West, but if you're trying to you know, prevent Russians from advancing, it's very useful. Uh, they have one that can extend and turn into a stretcher and basically you know, to get an injured guy out away from the lines. Apparently, if you are if Russian drones, if they see four Ukrainian guys carrying an injured guy, five guys in one place is a worthwhile target and they will bomb them. If you can have one or two guys together, generally the Russian drones won't bother. It's considered a waste of ammunition. So this can make a very big difference for having a drone that can go in, get the guy onto the stretcher and get him out of the, the danger area. Um, other with surveillance. Um, and, and it's just they, they, they have, you know. Apparently, it sounds like 50 different kinds and all kinds of different facilities. And they're all testing them. And they're, you know, all right, how do they deal with ditches? How do they deal with mud? How do they deal with all kinds of different terrain uh, to send all these drones around? And I believe, this is actually after I came back, 
I saw a report that the Russians in their last advance had uh, ground drones with machine guns on them. So for everyone who's seen Terminator and all the early model Terminators of, of just machine guns on wheels, that's what the Russians are deploying. Uh, we'll be probably be seeing very similar efforts on the parts of the Ukrainians. And um, yeah, so you asked about, you know, how did you get to see this? Greg, there were times when I was walking around and saying, why are they showing me this? This is some um, secret stuff that uh, and I did my best to make sure I didn't disclose anything I wasn't supposed to. But let's just say uh, the, the Ukrainians have some really bright people doing their darndest under some very difficult circumstances, absolutely determined to do what they can to help their country win the war. Well, a fantastic opportunity, and you described it extremely well. Jim, we're thrilled that you're back home safely, uh, but uh, what you learned there and are now able to share with us, I think, is vital as well. So your family can take a sigh of relief, and uh, we will be back to our usual fare on Monday. Have a great weekend. I was going to say, it was easier to get out of than, say, Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> That's a feather in their cap for sure. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, please subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Please tell your friends as well. Thanks also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. They are a huge help to us. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us both on X. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a terrific weekend and join us again on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.